Genetic traits can be separated into two broad categories, simple traits, which have discrete phenotypes, and complex traits, which have continuous phenotypes. Complex traits are controlled by a finite number of genes, each with a discrete influence on the overall phenotype. However, the number of genes is so large that the impact of any one gene is overshadowed by environmental variation to give the illusion of continuity. To make things more difficult, the nature of independent assortment meant it was impossible to study any complex gene in isolation. It was like trying to pilot a 747, except you could only change dials randomly. The challenge for geneticists was how do you make sense of the controls? In 1988, Patterson and Lander sought to answer this question for three complex traits in tomatoes, fruit mass, pH, and soluble solid concentration. Their approach involved positioning quantitative trait loci, or QTLs, within the genome by their association with genetic markers. These markers were DNA polymorphisms in the cutting sites of common enzymes, known as restriction fragment length polymorphisms, or RFLPs. These markers don't influence complex traits themselves, but the frequency at which a particular marker's genotype corresponds to a change in complex phenotype would inform the distance between a marker and the real QTL. Imagine this like a gold prospector who pans the nearby rivers for flakes. He cannot determine the gold deposit's location directly, but with many indirect measurements, he can make deductions and greatly narrow down his search. As with prospecting in genetics, more information leads to greater accuracy, and Patterson and Lander's RFLP map contained 70 markers with an average density of 14.3 centimorgans across all 12 chromosomes. The researchers selected parents with vastly different phenotypes to maximize the number of detectable QTLs. These were Lycopersicon esculentum, denoted E, and Lycopersicon shumiluski, denoted CL, which were bred through the following backcross design to produce 237 plants. Patterson and Lander genotyped the plants into E-type and CL-type subsets for each of the 70 markers. Next, they partitioned the interval between two adjacent markers into several points and estimated the probability that a QTL existed at each. These probabilities were divided by the probability that no QTL existed for the same point, and the logarithm of these ratios gave the set of LOD scores. An LOD score of 3 was considered significant, which meant a 1000 to 1 chance that the proposed QTL existed. Finally, they estimated the effect of the most likely putative QTL using the maximum likelihood method adapted by Lander himself. The researchers described the position and effect of 14 QTLs spread across the three traits. Early experiments in complex analysis were able to prove the existence of QTLs, but could not accurately locate them or quantify their effect. This limitation arose because these early papers relied on morphological markers, which could be genotyped by observation of an organism. However, these were scarce and unevenly distributed. It was nearly impossible to find a set of these markers, which covered every 50 centimorgan linkage region, and thus they left blind spots in the genome. Patterson and Lander broke through this barrier with RFLP markers. Since these markers were simple nucleotide polymorphisms, they were much more ubiquitous than morphological markers, which required functional changes to a gene. The abundance of information provided by RFLPs made interval mapping and maximum likelihoods feasible for the first time and Lander's methods were made prominent in the field. In this manuscript, QTL mapping evolved a level of detail and elegance analogous to Thomas Morgan's map of Drosophila, and these pioneering achievements did not go unnoticed. Patterson and Lander produced a result which encouraged other scientists to follow suit, and jump-started research in an exciting new direction. QTL maps were produced for many of the world's most important crops, and immense interest was generated in developing new market technologies which in turn facilitated more accurate analyses of increasingly complex organisms, notably wheat and sugarcane. Recently, S and P markers have made it possible to genotype changes in a single nucleotide, and the genome-wide study has made it possible to adapt QTL analysis to higher-order mammals. Both technologies are currently being used to understand the genetic factors which underpin human disease. And that brings us to an end of our story. Who would have thought the humble tomato would have played such an important role in unravelling the mysteries of genetics?